Okay, um, I think I've let everybody um, get a chance to be entered the uh, meeting. So uh, welcome everyone. Um, I hope this finds everybody safe and well. Um, this is the seventh at my count of the Westminster Development Policy Network virtual seminars. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate this one. And um, just a reminder that these seminars are co-organized with um, IFBRI based in Washington, DC, and also our colleagues in Wyatt based in Tashkent. Um, so today um, I'm going to welcome Alexander Shepatillo, who is from Aston University and also a member of the Westminster Development Policy Network. So it's great to have him with us today. He's going to um, describe, um, I think, a couple of papers around the area of gravity modeling and specifically in the area of the Belt and Road and the potential effects on Europe and Central Asia. We also have uh, George Magonis from the University of Portsmouth, who's going to act as a discussant today, so we'll give some time for that. And as usual, please just a reminder that you can shape the discussion towards the end of the session by putting any questions into the Q&A box or the chat box if you prefer. Um, so without further ado, thank you very much for joining us, Alexander, and um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, presenting in this series and, and uh, Karen is my uh, co-author in, um, in the papers that I will present today. Um, so um, she was uh, also working on this topic uh, and contributing to this uh, uh, results that I will present today. Uh, but uh, rather than just trying to focus on the Belt and Road policy, uh, my first uh, part of the uh, this lecture will be about uh, how to use gravity modeling for um, uh, policy analysis. So uh, you can think about the first part of this presentation as a general framework of uh, approaching various policy questions. And then um, in the second uh, part of this uh, presentation, I will give you show you two examples. I'll focus on one example more and then uh, briefly on the second one. And, and you see that there are lots of flexibility in this approach. Uh, I'll try to highlight uh, some results for Europe and Central Asia uh, as well. So because uh, our audience uh, in Tashkent will be interested in, in this, uh, I think. So um, let me uh, then briefly uh, show you the overview, yeah. So I'll talk about structural gravity uh, and um, the policies that I'm gonna use here is Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it's a Chinese um, policy, uh, which is mostly channeled toward uh, investment and transportation infrastructure. Uh, so I'll describe this um, initiative in a short, um, a bit and then um, we will we'll take this Belt and Road Initiative, uh, insert it in the gravity model, and then see how uh, what are the implications for global trade flows. Um, so I'll describe policy scenario, data, estimation, and key findings. Um, and uh, after that, I will uh, switch to uh, a different dimension, which is getting popularity in, in literature now, it's um, impact of uh, policy institutions and politics on, on trade. Uh, and in, in our uh, second example, I'll show you how you can work with certain policy dimensions, uh, political dimensions, and see how they influence trade flow uh, within structural gravity model as well. <clears throat> and then I will conclude. So uh, let me start with structural gravity modeling. Uh, the structural gravity uh, originally come from gravity model of trade, which has been suggested by Tinbergen in 1962. Um, and uh, it appears to be very uh, well describing uh, 
global trade flows and um, policymakers and uh, researchers, they in general are interested in policy, uh, sorry, in trade flows. So uh, why Germany trade with um, UK? Why uh, Uzbekistan trade with um, Russia, for example? And, and, and how much, even how much, yeah? So the gravity model is uh, quite, uh, I mean, one of the best in economics in terms of uh, its uh, predict in terms of it, its predictions and also it's very accurately describing trade flows. Uh, and at initial stage, this uh, model was considered as some empirical curiosity, but uh, serious economists considered it's um, um, as a reduced form, so you cannot really use it for policy analysis, but uh, later with uh, explosion of various models of trade, uh, we've got micro foundations of gravity model. So uh, today gravity model is not considered as reduced form, but it's a structural model where which um, can describe uh, various trade models like Eaton and Cortum uh, model of, uh, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Ricardian, uh, Anderson and, and Van Winkup uh, monopolistic competition model, uh, Cheney and Helpman heterogeneous uh, firms model. Yeah, so, uh, and it turns out uh, as was shown by Head and Meyer in 2014 and uh, and rodriguez Clair as well, uh, this, this is, this equation that I will describe, uh, it basically describe the trade flows under generally uh, any type of uh, trade model in the end. So uh, let's talk, uh, let's consider this a structural gravity. Uh, equation one here on this slide represent the uh, structural gravity model. On the left-hand side, we have uh, trade export from country I to country J. And then um, we have uh, the size of uh, country I economy is YI. And the size of uh, country J um, expenditure, spending sectors is EJ. So these two variables measure um, the sizes of economies in terms of production and consumption part. And uh, we divide this um, by the overall global uh, production. So basically it's a fraction of uh, world output that is consumed in country J. But because uh, there, is, there are transportation costs and the other trade barriers, the uh, trade is distorted, yeah? so. I mean, without uh, trade distortions, each country would uh, consume uh, whatever each other country produces according to its uh, ex expenditure size in the global economy. But when we have uh, uh, various uh, trade costs and trade barriers, they distort this very simple proportional model in a way that uh, capture actually real uh, picture. And so in, in the brackets here, we have a trade cost uh, between country I and J, which will include how far countries uh, apart, uh, what are the tariffs exist uh, to uh, export. Uh, it may include uh, things like if countries ha have common language or if countries uh, share uh, colonial uh, relationship. So <clears throat> the, the, this uh, parameter include all kind of trade flows, uh, sorry, all kind of uh, trade barriers or trade facilitators, facilitators which you can think of. And uh, in the denominator, we have omega i and pj. And these are actually the crucial parts of this uh, structural model because 
in the initial Tinbergen uh, model, we didn't have this uh, omega i and, and pi uh, and pj, but according to the theory, we should take into account um, the configuration of countries, how they are uh, located against each other and prices in, in each of these countries and trade costs in each countries. Yeah, for instance, uh, if we take New Zealand and Australia, which are located very close to each other, but very far up, apart from all other countries, this somehow should be reflected uh, in, the in the structural gravity because they will trade more with each other than, let's say, if we take uh, Belgium and um, Netherlands, which are located to each uh, close to each other as well, but also there are lots of other countries like Germany, UK, France, surrounding them, right? So um, this omega i and pj are called multi multilateral resistance terms, and they they will um, uh, capture overall configuration of of uh, global trade. Uh, distance between any pair of countries, uh, trade costs between any pair of countries, uh, uh, the sizes of any uh, any uh, neighboring countries, etc. Okay, so and therefore we have this equation two and three, which complement equation one, and make this uh, structural gravity model because these indices omega i and p j are actually the solution of, of the global trade flows. Yeah, so think about, you want to solve equation one and explain how trade uh, between any two countries evolve. But to solve equation two, one, you need to also solve equations two and three, and you should do it uh, in a, all together, like a system of equations in, in, in mathematics, right? So, um, we have uh, quite a few equations here to solve in the end. Um, but this model will be uh, describing uh, global trade equilibrium. Um, then uh, when we go to some practical details, how can we model any policy? There are, Two types of policies. Uh, one type of policy is the one that uh, affects is a production or consumption bit, and I will not be talking about those because those things uh, will affect GDP and expenditure part. For gravity model, GDP and expenditure part are given, so uh, we consider them as exogenous factors, at least uh, in. Uh, um, conditional uh, equilibrium, not in general equilibrium. So, but we will focus on uh, policies that influence trade costs, yeah? So in this equation here, we describe the trade costs between countries I and J, and you see that we have distance between countries I and J. We have a variable which uh, capture whether this countries I and J have um, free trade agreement, for example, between them. Uh, but you can think about other policies. Uh, you can think about um, whether they have um, common language or whether they have uh, uh, homogeneous non-tariff measures or whether they have uh, zero tariffs, yeah? So any variable which influence uh, trade costs can be uh, modeled in, in this bit in, in question four. Yeah, but also we control for other uh, factors with Zij is a variable which controls for things like common language, common border, uh, things like uh, colonial uh, past or military alliance. Yeah, we'll sh I'll show later that military alliances are very important determinants of international trade. Um, so, Okay, if you ask me how I model a Belt and Road Initiative uh, later on, uh, I will be modeling this with uh, this parameter lambda ij. So lambda ij is the um, parameter which 
captures any effect of um, better transport infrastructure on um, time of uh, travel between uh, point A and J, right? So we can think about distance, not in kilometers, but uh, uh, in terms of how long does it take to deliver goods from I to J, yeah? And if uh, transportation, if transport infrastructure becomes better, then this uh, tra time to travel becomes smaller. So, and, and therefore in this uh, example, which I will show you later, we'll capture effect of transport, infra transport infrastructure on uh, trade costs by uh, reducing lambda. So you reduce lambda, uh, and this is how you model impact of Belt and Road on, on transportation cost. Um, and, and then, uh, okay, so uh, we've got four equations now, equations one through four. And uh, it seems like uh, it's uh, quite a complicated question to, to solve. And initially uh, it was true that uh, people didn't use a lot this model, even though it appeared uh, Anderson and Van Winkup presented this idea of uh, solving a general model, but the approach was not very, uh, it was considered as correct one, but not that many people followed it because of uh, computational difficulty and not that many people knew how to solve how to estimate this model <clears throat> with all these equations. Because usually economists uh, use linear equations, uh, regression analysis. Not all, but ma majority, yeah? Um, but, um, well, it, it turned out that if you use a, a specific method of estimating gravity model one, yeah, so if we, uh, if you look at this equation one and you estimate it using Poisson pseudo maximum likelihood method, yeah, uh, or what we call it PPML. So in, in trade, uh, in trade, uh, international trade literature, PPML is the method to estimate gravity based on pseudo Poisson maximum likelihood. Um, and it's explained in paper by Silva and Tenreira, 2006. Um, and if in addition you add uh, exporting and importing country fixed effects, yeah. So if you if you estimate this uh, equation one by Poisson, and if you add uh, exporting and importing country fixed effect, uh, then finally in 2015, that's another economist, he proved that the fixed effects actually will be proportional to outward and inward multilateral resistance terms, okay? So you can estimate omega i and pj for each, each country by estimating gravity model using Poisson method and adding uh, exporting and importing country fixed effects. Okay, and then uh, after that, it's just a, a question of a little bit of algebra to compute uh, how trade uh, flows will change, how um, GDP will change and how um, welfare will um, be affected. Okay, so, and this is basically the core idea here is to um, present it in this slide. But uh, uh, technically speaking, so how do we uh, actually implement it using a computer? Well, uh, and how do we do counterfactual analysis with, with this approach? Yeah. And this algorithm uh, is describing uh, this idea um, as follows. You estimate model by Poisson method on actual data, yeah? And you, um, from, from this, from fixed effects, you recover P and omega for each country. Um, and then after that, you modify 
your policy variables in the way that you um, want to model counterfactual scenarios. For example, for my Belt and Road Initiative paper, I uh, introduced this lambdas, which reduce uh, distance between countries. Uh, as a result of uh, Belt and Road Initiative, yeah, I, 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 I said, for example, between these two countries, uh, trade cost related to distance will uh, will reduce by 15%, for example, and between uh, other two countries by 5%, etc. Or if you can uh, think about uh, some free trade agreements, you can uh, modify your policy variable from zero, no trade, no agreement to one. Uh, there is free trade agreement. Okay, and once you've done this, you estimate your model again, uh, like in part one, but with different variables. Okay, so you have different set of variables, you'll get different set of uh, multi multilateral resistant terms. Uh, and I call them P prime, omega prime, and then you will have a different GDP uh, value and different trade value, okay? And so once you have this, uh, all these variables, you can compare baseline initial values of, your, of your, all of your uh, variables and counterfactual. And you can compute percentage changes and uh, uh, this will give you um, quantification of, of your policy. Yeah, and, that, uh, and you, can, you can compute welfare effect in the end. So the welfare effect will uh, be computed as a ratio of uh, so-called real GDP in the counterfactual scenario over real GDP in a baseline scenario. Yeah. And we express it as, as percent um, in percentage term. OK, so um, any questions so far? So um, uh, please uh, don't forget to post your questions. Um, and I'm, I'm going to move to uh, two examples. Yeah, and uh, they are based on uh, my work with uh, Karen Jackson. One is published in the uh, China Economic Review um, this year, and another is uh, still a work in progress. Okay, so um, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, probably uh, most people already have information about it and understand what it is, um, but um, it's a um, group of projects unified by kind of a common idea is to invest in uh, transport infrastructure and in infrastructure in general to improve con connectivity of China with uh, the rest of the world, especially the countries which are poorly connected to the rest of the world, such as Central Asia, uh, uh, South Asia, also some areas of South Asia uh, are poorly connected to China. And let's say as the idea of Eurasian transport corridor of uh, shipping goods from China to Europe through uh, Central Asia and through Russia. Yeah. Um, so, and our work was focused on, on this uh, Eurasian transport corridor, how, uh, by, by how much trade will go up if uh, China invests in transport infrastructure and this will allow to ship goods more quicker between China and uh, Europe. So th this uh, slide presents, show you some, um, so what is called transport corridors along the Belt and Road. And, and you see that uh, the red ones are um, part of uh, land infrastructure and the blue ones are part of uh, sea infrastructure. And we are focusing on this land infrastructure corridors, especially this new Eurasia land bridge. So it, it connects China with uh, Europe, European countries. 
uh, via uh, Central Asia and Kazakhstan. Yeah. So we thought what would happen if, um, and uh, yeah, what is actually happening, what happens when the transportation cost uh, declines here? Yeah. Um, and uh, I will just skip several slides. I, I'll show you this picture that this, which basically uh, describe, describe the um, various projects which uh, are funded by Chinese, um, is a government or uh, organizations related to Chinese um, commercial structures. And, um, and it's collected by Center for Strate Strategic and International Studies. So you see that this, there are lots of projects going on. Um, and if we think about this uh, Belt and Road Initiative related to um, Eurasian land bridge, uh, how it may affect trade? Well, instead of moving uh, goods, uh, shipping goods uh, by sea, the goods can be shipped by uh, rail. And rail uh, make it uh, much quicker to deliver goods. Maybe a uh, save of time will be a uh, 50% reduction, maybe more. It's true that uh, uh, railroad is, is more expensive at the moment, but uh, uh, it can be, uh, the cost can be reduced and it, it is reduced by uh, investing in, in infrastructure. So, and we model this transportation cost reduction between 15 to 50% reduction. Yeah, um, and we, justified uh, using various evidence uh, from different sources. Um, so first of all, the reduction in, in travel time between uh, sea and uh, land is about uh, up to 50% reduction. Uh, the, the cost is higher, this is true. But uh, according to Reed and Trubitskoy 2019 paper, it's a part of big project de developed by World Bank. They estimated uh, what this will be uh, real trade cost reduction using very detailed uh, data. So instead of we do simplification assumption about uh, making it very simple, uh, trade cost reduction by um, certain percent, they've done it much more uh, meticulously and found that the freight rate will be reduced by 30 to 50%. But also uh, it will facilitate trade across countries by uh, not only investing in transport infrastructure, but by streamlining procedures between for, go for goods to uh, move uh, from China to Europe. Um, and if you take all this into account, then 50% uh, trade trade cost reduction doesn't look that, that much, but we have a range from 15% to 50%. Anyway, so uh, we will present uh, different estimates. Uh, one of the examples of uh, the projects which are built uh, through this built and road initiative is largest dry port on the border of Kazakhstan and China. Uh, and this dry port will solve the, the following uh, problem that uh, the Russian standard uh, railroad has different size than uh, railroads of other countries. And so when, when goods move from China to, to countries of former Soviet Union, then uh, they should be moved from one carrier to, to some other carrier. Uh, which use different uh, rails. And this uh, dry port in Kazakhstan, in Korgas, uh, will, will basically will move uh, containers from one type of uh, uh, rail road transportation to the other. Yeah, so this will be a tra transfer point from Chinese transport uh, standards to um, Russian. And then after this uh, transfer, goods can travel to the border of uh, Russia with Europe or 
border of Belarus with Poland, for example, where they will again be, be moved from a Russian system of rail to European system. Yeah, so you see that this is one of the bottleneck of this uh, idea is to, to make this uh, transfers as quick as possible. Um, all right, so now let's look at the, at, at the result of our simulation. So, okay, so we uh, have this Belt and Road Initiative. We uh, model uh, reduction in transportation cost, uh, how actually uh, it will uh, play out. Uh, we uh, would like to not only uh, measure the effect of Belt and Road here, but also compare it with other possible policies or policies that uh, can be implemented. Uh, even uh, uh, the, some of them will be very unrealistic, some of them will be more realistic, but uh, it will be a nice matrix to compare. So we also consider a free trade agreement between, between China and European Union as a benchmark uh, according to which we'll uh, compare the result of Belt, Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, in addition, we look at uh, other trade initiatives which exist in the world. Uh, we start, when we started this project, uh, um, there was TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which um, actually didn't materialize uh, with selection of Trump especially. Uh, but probably current uh, administration probably will consider some kind of uh, talks about uh, trade, transatlantic trade. For example, uh, new solution, new decision about Airbus uh, Boeing dispute to show us some, some hope in that direction. And another initiative was Trans-Pacific Partnership. So we consider how uh, other partnerships or policies will uh, play in favor or against Belt and Road Initiative. And so we have these four scenarios, which we will uh, model and compare. Uh, we use data for 162 countries uh, from 1960 to 2014, primarily to uh, estimate effect of uh, free trade agreements on uh, trade because uh, this is one of the key elements is to understand how much any potential free trade agreement will have impact on trade between China and EU countries. So uh, trade data from IMF, then we have uh, macro variables from uh, World Bank, trade policy and trade cost data from uh, CPE, French uh, international think tank. Um, then we estimate um, such things as trade policy elasticities with regard to free trade agreements. Yeah, because this is one of the key elements is to understand how free trade agreement will affect trade. And we see that um, free trade agreement in our um, scenarios, effect varies from roughly 38 to 51% uh, increase in trade approximately. Okay, so. It's a little bit different, but um, coefficients uh, are quite in a narrow range and, and they are quite uh, highly positive and significant. All right, so, and uh, finally, uh, now I would like to show you results. I'll, I'll be showing the results quite uh, quickly and um, we can discuss later if you have some questions. Uh, yeah, so this is the result of implementing Belt and Road on welfare. So by how much a representative consumer will be better off if the policy is implemented. Um, we have regions in, the, in the rows and in columns we have uh, different assumptions about transport cost reduction. And I should tell you for, for this experiment, we can see the transport cost reduction between European Union and China. Only. So we don't look at uh, uh, projects um, which exist in any particular country, because when, when you start doing this exercise, we didn't have this information about which countries will get which projects and et cetera, et cetera, okay? So this is just a, a transport cost reduction 
along the way. Uh, and, and you see that, uh, of course, uh, it's a substantial increase in welfare, even with a mild, very small reduction in transport cost of 0.64% uh, for China, 0.3% uh, for European Union, but even along the way, countries will, uh, will benefit. And I should tell you that uh, we also did the same uh, analysis using World Bank estimates of trade cost reductions. Uh, and if we use World Bank estimates of uh, trade cost reductions uh, for Europe and Central Asia regions, uh, effect will, will be 2% increase in welfare. Okay, so this result is uh, for generic transport cost reduction, but if you uh, insert actual uh, or better estimates of trade cost reduction, the Central Asia region will benefit uh, more than any other region in terms of welfare from Belt and Road Initiative uh, uh, that reduced transportation cost. Okay, uh, then we looked at what would be effect of uh, free trade agreement between China and European Union. Yeah, uh, it turns out it's, it's quite big. Uh, for China, it would be 2.56% increase in welfare. For European Union is 1.16. So if you compare this uh, numbers with uh, numbers in, in this table, well, it's roughly equivalent of 45% reduction in transportation costs. Okay, so the, the effect of trade agreement is, is very strong. Yeah. But on the other hand, effect of Belt and Road Initiative is comparable to uh, such a uh, probably unrealistic, but uh, very uh, big agreement between China and EU on trade. Yeah, so they are comparable in magnitude, I should say. Uh, also, if you combine these two together, so if you say, if you have free trade agreement and reduction in transportation cost, obviously you'll have even, even larger uh, welfare improvements. But interestingly, um, the effect will magnify itself, reinforce itself, okay? So basically, if you take this table here and add these numbers in appropriate regions, you will get numbers which are smaller than numbers in this table. Okay, it means that free trade agreement combined with uh, reduction in transportation cost will have bigger effect, logic cumulative effect on, on welfare. Um, okay, um, so we also have an effect of uh, a result for other global initiatives, but I will skip them for the sake of, uh, because I'm, I'm starting run, running out of time. We also see that the effect of um, free trade agreements, for example, on uh, trade formation and uh, welfare is not happening straight away, like some people think, yeah. So some people from, um, for example, uh, would say that when we, should we have this effect, we should have effects right away. No, it's not true. The effect of uh, trade policy changes uh, occurs in a substantial period of time. Um, yeah, and also if you look at the role of free trade agreements over time, the impact getting bigger. If you look at this panel, uh, uh, right panel of this uh, graph, this is average effect of free trade agreement over, um, over years. You see that starting from 1980s, the average free trade agreement has a bigger and bigger impact on trade. Okay, so which means that uh, uh, countries getting more and more benefit from uh, bilateral trade agreements rather than multilateral WTO agreements. Um, and we have some analysis of uh, reduction in transportation cost and elasticity of substitution parameter, but it's kind of technical point here. Um, okay, now uh, I'll skip this uh, key findings here and I'll talk about the second uh, approach that we used uh, uh, because we've said, okay, well, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, of course, is not only uh, 
reduction in transportation costs, but it's also about politics, security, bilateral relationship between countries. And we wanted to model this as well. So we wanted to model how political affiliation or political affinity across countries influence uh, uh, their trade flows. So, uh, and uh, this is done under this umbrella of new type of great powers relations, which is promoted by China. So they see this uh, Belt and Road Initiative as the uh, vehicle to um, extend their influence as well, right? So even politically. So, um, and what happens when countries align closer to uh, politically to China, whether will it have an effect on, on trade or not? Um, and we know from literature, of course, we know from literature that uh, countries which are more closer politically with to each other, they trade more. And we also know that Chinese government is very sensitive about uh, other countries' political views on the internal affairs. Uh, for example, there is a so-called Dalai Lama effect. Uh, the countries uh, to which da Dalai Lama travels experience uh, problems uh, in their trade with China afterwards because Chinese start uh, uh, in, uh, introducing some uh, uh, additional trade barriers, non-tariff uh, measures against um, countries uh, in which Dalai Lama uh, visited. Um, and so we contribute to this literature by examining how Belt and Road Initiative changes political environment across countries and how it will affect trade and welfare. Um, yeah, and uh, just briefly uh, in remaining uh, several minutes, what we're doing here, we uh, consider how politics and institutions influence uh, productivity of countries and how it influences uh, transportation costs, but also how military alliances and uh, political affinity between countries influence trade as well. So in our gravity model, we introduce uh, two variables, military alliance and uh, policy affinity. The military alliance is a dummy variable which measures uh, whether countries are uh, form defend union, uh, defend pact or not. And the alliance, uh, political al uh, alliance between countries is, or political aff affinity is how close they are voting in United Nations, how, how close they are uh, synchronized in their political, uh, in, in, their, in their policies. Yeah, and it turns out this both coefficient for military alliance and for affinity are st strongly, positively, and significant. So countries uh, are um, trading more if they have a military alliance. Trade countries trade more if they are uh, more politically aligned to each other. So uh, this slide with the data. In addition to the previous data, we use this. Um, Defense Alliance data from correlates of war and uh, formal bilateral political relations data from Bailey uh, and co authors 2017. So th this data computes uh, political differences across countries. Um, yeah. And then we uh, form the scenarios uh, such as forming military alliance, um, strengthening political affinity, and uh, higher political stability in addition to Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, so we compare Belt and Road Initiative against different political decisions as well. And I'm gonna skip uh, to, to main results. Uh, first of all, forming defense alliance or moving closer to each other politically, increase trade between countries. And for Europe and Central Asia, for example, Belt and Road Initiative uh, it would increase trade by, by 2.6%, but Defense Alliance by um, more than 6%. Uh, 
uh, and political affinity by about extra 1% increase in trade. And this, these numbers can be added together because uh, these different policies will reinforce each other. Um, yeah, and finally, these are our uh, table with welfare changes under different scenarios, uh, including um, Belt and Road Initiative, Defense Alliance, political affinity, and pol political stability. Uh, and you see that uh, Defense Alliance will be most beneficial for China, for example, um, but uh, uh, comparable with, uh, let's say, Belt and Road Initiative. And I think I'm running out of time, so um, I will skip conclusions and I uh, will tell you that if you're interested in, in any detail here, uh, please read our papers. Uh, the first one is available uh, as a publication in China and Economic Review. And if you want to know about the second one, uh, it's available on request. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. And um, I think we'll just turn to George to ask him for some um, initial kind of comments and maybe some questions to get the discussion started. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Alexander, for these two pieces of uh, work. Very interesting. Actually, I have uh, I have read these two papers. So. Um, I know that you support that uh, EQ can capitalize on these opportunities uh, if they can develop stronger strategic oversight investment uh, flows. So from this point, I have two questions. Uh, let me first uh, answer me, actually, please, the first in order to proceed. Uh, do you think that the new EU FDI screening mechanism uh, achieves this target? Uh, well, well, I think I think it's, this is something which is a uh, um, very substantial step forward in this direction, right? So I think um, uh, you mean EU China FDI agreement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I think this is another part of the puzzle which we tried to solve. Uh, we 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 didn't solve it uh, successfully in the end because. Modeling investment in addition to trade is, uh, appears too much uh, for one model, but um, uh, we did some initial estimates of uh, effect of foreign direct investment on welfare. So if you add foreign direct investment to this model, then uh, it further increases welfare both for European Union and for China. Of course, uh, the, the detail of this policy is uh, yet to be, you know, like um, to see how how effective this is gonna be. But suppose if it's effective, if uh, it will attract more FDI, then of course um, it will have additional um, positive effect and it will be a step in the right direction. But also um, there, is, there is a question of what type of FDI is gonna be, right? So whether it's uh, just uh, some knowledge uh, FDIs, which uh, uh, Chinese uh, advanced company like Huawei uh, with some new um, technology uh, in present, or it's just, a, um, you know, like a typical capital, like a traditional capital, which exists in uh, all countries, but China just uh, provided cheaper, then effect will be sm smaller, but still uh, there's going to be effect, of course. Right. Uh, in a similar vein, do you think that there is a, a need for FDI screening in a Central Asia context? Um, I, I'm not sure. I am aware about this policy issue. Um, what, what do you mean by uh, in, in which regards uh, screening of? Um, okay, can you elaborate a little bit? I mean the process of the FDI, the, the FDI flows, but I guess, okay, this is not strictly related to the results. This is a broader question. So maybe uh, it's not so relevant to the discussion, but I just wanted your opinion based on your general uh, research on the area. What is your personal view? But we can skip if uh, 
this is not so clear. Um, I have noted another question. So um, to what extent do you think that uh, the G7 Build Back Better World initiative might offer real competition for uh, China in Central Asia? Oh, yes, this is a, a very good question. And uh, it's, yeah, it's yet another initiative uh, which um, uh, is in a sense it's it's competing initiative uh, yeah um and well in in one dimension um the trade between uh, j7 countries is already very liberalized so there is no that much of uh, improvement in terms of uh, trading goods um but of course still there are some non-trade non-tariff measures exist and uh, it's going to be uh, welfare improvement for uh, J7 countries, and of course, uh, if uh, even though the trade uh, gains are not zero sum, but when uh, some union is formed and uh, China is not part of that union, it will uh, be competing against Chinese uh, initiative. So it will have a, a negative impact um, in, in in some sense on on them. But if you have two initiatives together. It will have a benefit for all other, for many other countries, I think. Uh, but also, uh, J7, I think, uh, have a, a lot of um, room for improvement in terms of services economies and digital digitalization, digital trade. And this is the area in which uh, not much research is done. But uh, if you think about uh, reduction in barriers in, in services and uh, digital and also improvement in investment across G7 countries, I think uh, it will be a competing initiative, which is uh, has a, 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 as big potential, maybe bigger potential than Belt and Road Initiative. Right. Uh, well, that was uh, my questions. Thank you, Alexander. It was very useful, uh, your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess maybe just one final comment because we've got just a few minutes to, before we conclude the session. I guess for some people listening, I noticed that we've got quite a few participants who probably come from um, Central Asia. And I, I think this concept which has been introduced in the uh, European and EU setting where, you know, member states have been encouraged to kind of um, screen investment. So, you know, in order to decide whether in fact the investment should go ahead. Um, I, I, I mean, that, as far as I'm aware, that doesn't happen in a Central Asian context because there's not that um, natural grouping. So to enable that sort of coordination. Um, but, but I wonder whether that you know, is it possible just for each country, do you think, to uh, to sort of screen these investments? Do you think that's happening at the moment? Maybe more in a Eurasia context, perhaps, um, more broadly than just Central Asia. Do you think that there is that element, or do you think that investment is just being accepted without particularly, you know, either formal or informal screening taking place? Well, I, I think that uh, it would be uh, a good policy to to evaluate. Uh, I mean, I, I heard that, of course, uh, ideally, each investment should uh, proceed if it's efficient and uh, if it's actually related to transport cost reduction or investment in infrastructure, which um, is improving connect connectivity, yeah. But uh, on the other hand, we all know that um, in the um, environment of uh, imperfect information, but also um, imperfect information about nature of projects, about uh, uh, information about uh, cost of project, it's it's very hard to um, decide which uh, investment among. Um, provide more efficient uh, uh, output than others. So I think screening should uh, play 
of course, a role, ideally, yeah, so that um, the, the better projects are selected and uh, the ones that are not uh, very um, uh, relevant or the ones that are not really uh, in, reduces transportation costs, they, they should not go ahead. And of course, it's a kind of a, a difficult problem to solve, especially for Chinese uh, government, uh, because uh, I think they are facing this problem of, uh, um, uh, they're facing this problem of uh, getting returns on their investment. In some cases, it's just a wasteful uh, investment uh, from, uh, economic point of view. But uh, yeah, that's always uh, the case and always some screening uh, would uh, improve uh, the quality, that would improve quality of projects would be beneficial. But of course, the question is, uh, how do we decide which, do we know, have enough information to, 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 to decide which uh, projects are uh, profitable ex ante, it's, uh, it's difficult. I think, uh, I'm sure there are a number of people listening today who, who might be based, um, you know, in Uzbekistan. And of course, it's a very interesting um, policy from a point of view of a country which is double landlocked, isn't it? You know, this kind of uh, these trade routes are critically important, and I think um, it is different. It is interesting the difference across different parts of Central Asia or maybe Euro Asia in general, the different attitudes towards these investments. You know, in some countries there's a competition to invest. <laughs> and in others, you know, in fact countries are happy to sort of take whatever investment is offered. So um, I think it's very interesting times ahead and uh, particularly so with these um, attempts by the EU and um, maybe dare I say the US led G7 um, sort of new initiative um, and it'll be quite an interesting period to see what the effect is in the Central Asian context and the, this competition that's emerging on these kind of investments through infrastructure projects. Um, that's great, well it's, if I don't have any further, oh I have one um, further question. Um, so yeah, one further question, which is um, debt management strategy and development agenda might be important factors in the BRI investment. So I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Um, of course, this constant, this, this issue, we haven't really touched on it today so far, but um, the fact that of course, um, accepting these investments might lead to a high debt burden for some countries. I don't know whether you want to comment on that as a final point today. Yeah, well, uh, I just, uh, I want to agree with this uh, statement, of course, uh, that not only we should think about efficiency, but also, of course, uh, in the the way it's financed is important. The uh, transition period uh, when debt may go up for some countries is very important. And also some uh, projects are more uh, development friendly, some projects are, are um, increasing the quality and maybe lead to some uh, other project. So of course, uh, that should be considered. And that's why um, the current approach of uh, Belt and Road projects probably doesn't look at this question in, in, in that many details that it deserves. But I should agree with Karen that the competition, let's say, between J7 initiative and Belt and Road initiative would be beneficial for, let's say, Central Asia, which um, probably be, was not as, uh, was maybe neglected by uh, uh, before, but now it's getting into the more central stage. Uh, and uh, of course, it's going to be an interesting uh, period to uh, look at economic development of Central Asia uh, and uh, China and Europe as well. Thank you very much. So um, thank you, Alexander, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you for, to George for joining us from the University of Portsmouth. Um, just to say a big thank you, of course, to the people who organized this with me. So. Um,
um, it's brain based in Washington, D.C. and my colleagues in Tashkent from Wyatt. Um, I think um, it's a nice opportunity to bring researchers from across different areas of the world together. And I know that some people will be joining us by watching the recording later. So um, just leaves me to say, stay safe and well. And uh, thank you for joining us. And I do hope some of you will join us next week for the last in our eight sessions for the series. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.